All right, let me, um, let me begin with a word of prayer. Ahem. 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 All right. Here we go. Dear Father, we uh, thank you for this day. Again, I thank you for these students and for their work on the homework. I pray that it be rewarded, that they would learn the material, and that it would sink in. And uh, I just pray that they would be encouraged as they work on the next mission, that they do their best in the upcoming week. And we just, again, thank you, Lord, for your creation, which uh, you've created for us to enjoy, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Uh, so, hey, we can talk about the solution to mission one here for a minute. Anything in particular you want to look at? So this is the solution to mission one. It's posted in Canvas already, right? So we can, you know, let's take five minutes to talk about it. Um, problem one is pretty straightforward. I don't think I really need to say much about that. Um, problem two, um, the idea here basically is just to, um, you know, figure out what the components are of A. That's the main, main issue here. Well, A is, you know, A times its unit vector, which in this case is, you know, cosine theta, sine theta, but theta is given to be 110 degrees, so you get this for the Cartesian components, and then you can add these. And, well, then you can multiply A by 2 and subtract B, and you get this, and then you got to look at it. Well, you're in quadrant 2, right? So be careful, inverse tangent's not going to do it for you. Um, you got to add 90 degrees if you're just going to take the inverse tangent of that ratio, right? So there's that. Um, see, I don't want to talk about all of them. Let me go on here. Uh, this is the, the triangle problem. You know, pretty much you just make a picture and then find the vectors which connect, you know, the displacement from one vertex to another. And then once you find those vectors, you can calculate the angle between two vectors using the dot product, right? And then, well, it's a triangle, so the sum of the angles is 180 degrees. So once you figure out two angles, if you're confident in your work, you get the third, third one for free, right? If you guys believe the sum of the angles in a triangle is 180 degrees, do you believe? Okay, good. So I got that. Um, the hamster assassin problem, which I'll let you look at. Let's see here. I had a couple different interpretations there. Um, I had to draw a picture. So I drew this picture to start with, and then I thought about it. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. That doesn't even, I can't even make sense of the problem with that picture. So I realized the picture has to look like that. Like Brandon has to be here. Magaga has to be over there. Swanson has to be over there, something like that. And then once I realized that's what it looked like, then I could solve the problem. I solve, like everything in here, if you look at my solution, I solve it with vectors, right? I figure out the unit vector that points in the direction between the islands, and I multiply that by the magnitude, the distances, which I don't know. Um, I mean, I know one of the distances, right? I know 4.76 kilo kilometers, but I don't know the distance between um, the other two, right? So then it gives me two equations, two unknowns, which I can solve, and I get that. So, um, Problem seven, actually, um, despite looking kind of scary, it was actually probably the easiest problem in this homework, you know, because it's just algebra. You take the dot product of d with d, that's a distance squared, and you get that. Let me just skip ahead to the, um, um, the uh, final problem here, since some of, somebody asked me about it, right? So... If you, work, if you work out the formula for the arc length for the um, Kakashi at the end, you end up with this lovely equation here. And then if you set that equal to um, 51.749 and use technology, you'll find out that, in fact, t is about 10 seconds. So, so I think what I actually did was I just set 51.749 equal to this integral in Wolfram Alpha, and then I found out it was 10 seconds. So, like I said, at the end of all that, a numerical method was needed. Um, you can't just, I mean, you can, it actually turns out you can find a formula closed form for the arc length. There it is. But can you solve this equal to a number? Well, I can't, right? So even though you get a closed form formula, 
for the arc length, solving for t equal to that, that's just too hard, right? So you have to use a numerical method at, at the end of all that. I have everybody's mission from today. Who am I missing? Somebody came in late. Can I have it? Thank you. Yeah, you got a name. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so um, here is the solution to today's mission. Is there any particular one you guys would like to look at at the moment? Let's see here. So let's see here. Is there any particular one? I got. 13.89 degrees and about 49 steps for that one. I got 4L for problem 16. Um, for this one, I got 53.13 degrees after my wife corrected it. You can see the white out. Um, my wife had me convinced that there was not a unique answer to this problem for a time, but then I found my way back to reality. So there is a unique answer because of the nature of the problem. <sighs> Some people might have thought to try to solve this putting the cat at the max height, but you can't do that because you're given the initial angle is 30 degrees. So once you fix 30 degrees, that, that kind of forces the max height to a certain, you know, x relative to that. Y you can't have with, the, with everything that's given to you in the problem, you can't make where the cat is at the zenith of the flight. It's just not possible. So you have to solve the equations. And here they are. So I got 52.32 meters per second. Um, the uh, Ron Swanson problem is essentially the same problem. It's just different given, right? And that one works out to a... And it's understandable if you got stuck on this one because you got to have... Um, the wherewithal to realize that you're up against a quadratic equation in tangent squared. Yeah? And then that you solve, and you get two angles, 77.39 and 6.89 degrees. Um, problem 20 and 21, I more or less talked about in class the other day. Let me skip those. Uh, I've talked about that stuff enough, I think. Um, here... Uh, problem 22 is pretty standard, you know, vector breakdown, add them together. I think your second lab is almost this, you know? You got that force table stuff hanging off of it. I don't know, have you guys done that lab yet? No? I can't, I've, have you done the one where you just do uh, draw pictures and talk to each other? No, no single lab yet? See, I live a charmed existence right now. I'm not teaching lab, so. Um, I mean, I love lab really interesting and necessary for understanding physics. Um, okay, so then here, problem 24 is, here's the equation I just for the life of me couldn't think to write yesterday, yesterday, you know what I mean. See this right here? This was what I was like stuck on at the start of class, just writing this down. Mass times acceleration for the flat track problem is the force of friction, which is a vector, plus the normal force, plus the force of gravity. The thing is, these are the only vertical forces. They cancel out, right? Which means that the magnitude of the acceleration is totally dependent on the force of friction, right? This simplifies to just the force of friction, which is a kind of complicated force. It's always pointing in the direction of the motion because it's what makes it go, all right? So the force of friction, it's always going a different direction for a car traveling in a circle. You know, it's, it's, it's a rather complicated business where it's pointing. And, um, you know, there's also a kind of dangerous thing here that was just pointed out to me by um, Dr. Scambordis. And, and he said he doesn't tell students this, so I probably shouldn't tell you. But I'm going to tell you. Force of friction is equal to mu s or mu k times the normal force, right? It perhaps should be emphasized, this is not a vector equation. Do you understand that? Like, the force of friction is not pointing in the same direction as the normal force. 
Friction is just really weird thing that takes a force which is like this, right? And it produces an opposing force for motion in a totally different direction. Like friction is direction changing in terms of its, you know, its application. It's a really weird thing. Um, this, is, this is always understood in, as, as a magnitude equation, all right? Now the normal force is always normal to the surface. That's true. But um, so I don't know if that, that's what was my hang up. I don't think so. I just was just dumb last class. But um, anyway, it's just that. And then you can go from there. Um, so for this one, the weight was, the, the friction force was point, the, the coefficient of static friction was 0.9. So your force of friction max is 0.9 mg. And it just kind of goes from there. If you want the max speed, you want the tangential acceleration to be zero. So you just set 0.9 mg equals to mv squared over r. And you get like 22 meters per second for this one, I think. Um, 21, my bad. And then the other one, <clears throat> as I was telling you last class, the acceleration is the square root of the centripetal piece plus the tangential piece squared, right? So since I'm saddling you with 2 meters per second squared for the tangential piece, we get a little bit less, right? So we get, end up with a centripetal acceleration of about 8.59, which is less than 0.9 g, right? What's 0.9 g? Calculator. Because we, we were saying in the part A, the centripetal acceleration is 0.9 g, which is what? 8 point what? Uh, 441 over 50, thank you, calculator. 8.82, 8.82 is 0.9 g. So here, because part of the acceleration is tangential, we're down to 8.59 as opposed to 8.82, right? 8.59 means you have a smaller centripetal acceleration and consequently a smaller speed around the circle, right? So the, the, the key thing to remember about circular motion more than anything else is that this is non-negotiable, all right? So like if you're in circular motion, you have a centripetal acceleration of v squared over r. That's, that's non-negotiable. That has to be happening. You may or may not have tangential acceleration, right? So that's a more nuanced bit, um, depending on the kind of circular motion you're talking about. Um, one, one last thing, and then I'll put this away. Think about this. You're going around a curve, right? Why is it, as you're going around a curve, that, and you, you do this, right? You break going into the curve, but you accelerate going out. Why? Ever thought about this? Yeah. Because you'll go faster around the curve, right? I mean, what, what is the thing? Why don't we just hit the accelerator all the way through the, the curve? I mean, that would make us go faster, right? What's the problem? <laughs> yeah. It won't, fly off. won't fly off, right? So once you're in that curve, right? Once you, so this, suppose this is the straightaway here, right? And the straightaway over here. So once you enter that curve, you must be supplying a centripetal acceleration like this, right? You have to have that centripetal acceleration like that. Like that's written in stone. Whatever your speed is, v squared over r, you have to have that much of your acceleration center seeking, right? So of course, if you, if you slow down <clears throat> going into the curve, then your acceleration vector is doing what? So like slowing down makes your, this is a slowing down acceleration vector, right? So like you're essentially, your net acceleration is something like this, yeah? If you're tangentially slowing down, it makes your net acceleration like that, which is, you know, but the, the larger point is you're slowing down the speed. But coming out of it, if your tangential acceleration is like this, that's not a bad thing, right? Because then your net acceleration is like that. So you're, you're sort of, as you're accelerating out of the curve, you're putting acceleration into what becomes the tangential direction. And it's not a bad thing to fly off in the tangential direction as you're leaving the curve, right? As you're leaving the, bank, the, the curve, you, you'd like to fly off in that direction because that's where the road is, you know? There's an asymmetry. Brake going into the curve, accelerate going out. The idea that you should accelerate going out is perhaps slightly non-intuitive, non right? Like, there's a more cautious sort of naive person who would just be like, no, you brake all the way through the curve. It's a curve, right? You don't want to fly off it. But actually, you should accelerate coming out. <clears throat> you, can, you can do that. Anyway, I think you can kind of see that <clears throat> from these things. With that, I'll put this away as I'm about out of batteries. And for some reason, my voice is going. So that's not good. <clears throat>
Any questions? So it has just been covered. There is a stapler. Where was it? The computer lab, which is on the what floor? Second floor. Second floor. You've been there, right? It's where people play games on the computers. Oh, no, that's another room. I don't know. So, <clears throat> so let's do some examples, yeah? So um, <clears throat> let me start out with a, um, a relatively simple problem. Suppose we've got a box, all right? And this time, <clears throat> I want to... <clears throat> Um, connect it with a string to a pulley. All right. And uh, over that pulley, there's another box over here hanging. All right. <clears throat> so let me say this is M1. And over here, you got M2. And um, I probably should tell you the angle. I need to tell you some angle. What angle would you like? One degree. <laughs> no, 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 no. Like where would you like the angle to be? We could put it here. Let's put it there. This angle, let's say, is, well, 30 degrees. I like 30 degrees. OK. And um, let's. Let's put friction in the mix, all right? So you're given um, mu sub s greater than zero, okay? So, all right. So you un do you understand? This is a pulley. What's that do? So it's a pulley, and we're going to say that the pulley itself is frictionless. and um, essentially massless. What that means is it doesn't offer any kind of resistance to spinning, OK? And we're also going to assume that this rope that's connecting the two masses is likewise massless, all right? Like it's so, it's so light in comparison to these masses, M1 and M2, we can essentially neglect the mass, all right? So then the... Um, the question, there's a couple different questions you can ask here, right? You can ask, does the box slide, right? And then you can ask the question, if the box is sliding, right, um, what's its acceleration? Okay, backdrop of all this, this is all on the surface of the Earth, right? Gravity, mg is the force of gravity, and um, despite the slight, slight slant here, I'm assuming that this is level, a level plane, okay? level ground. So how do you how do you solve this kind of problem? Well, the answer is one step at a time. All right, we got to break it into pieces and kind of dissect it. So, what's going on here <clears throat> is on mass 2. Let's start with mass 2. Okay? And um, tell you what, just to, to keep things relatively simple, let's, let's suppose that it's moving, OK? Let's suppose that it's moving. So I'm going to call that a K for kinetic, and that will make our life a little bit easier to think about. So if it's moving, which direction is it moving? What's that? Oh, yeah, that away? OK. So we're assuming then that the motion's something like this, right? So imagine that M1 is a big block of styrofoam, and maybe M2 is like gold. I don't know. OK? So it's, it's heavy enough to make M1 move, right? OK, so then what? What is it? Why does M2 move M1? Like, wh why is that? Yep. Tension. tension. Very good. It's the tension in the rope, right? It's that rope pulling. And um, <clears throat> so what we do then is we look at the free body diagram on M2. On M2, I'm going to write it down here because it's, you know, too small up there. Um, so I've got, a, I've got tension, T, like that, upwards, right? And downwards, what, what's, what's the force on M2? 
Gravity, right, so M2G goes down. Is there any other force on M2? No, that, that's it, all right? That's it. We're assuming air friction is negligible, right? Okay, so how about M1? What's the free body diagram on M1? I got a couple different things going on, right? I've got, so like if I, let me draw it up here again. So the tension is like this here, right? And M2G there. Well, if the tension's going up like this, <clears throat> it's also up over here like this, right? So I don't think I said this yet, but I should. We're assuming that the rope doesn't stretch, all right? So that implies that the tension has to be the same at one point and another on the rope. If it wasn't, that would mean that the rope was stretching. Okay, so since it's not stretching, we have the same tension. Um, the, same, the rope is pulling up on M2 the same way it's pulling uh, M1, essentially, okay? So same tension, same magnitude, different direction though, right? Different direction. So we've got T over here, like so. Um, that should be the same length if I was doing my picture right, okay? Don't read anything to the scale there. What else is going on? What else is going on? Gravity and force. Oh, just so you know, this was like a, a, like a, like a little, I don't know, tower. There we go. There, it's a stupid, stupid looking tower. There you go. Um, and what did you say? You just said no, gravity and the normal force. I like it. I'm going to allow that one. So, yeah, we got our M1G, like so. And we got a normal force, like this, yeah. Okay, I, I totally agree. Very good. What else? Friction. Friction. And where does that go? Straight left. Straight left. Very good. So, force of friction over this away. So the, the first order of business in any problem like this is to draw the free body diagrams and to come to terms with what are all the forces at work, all right? Once you figure that out, then you have earned the right to write down Newton's laws, okay? What are Newton's laws? Well, we've got two masses, right? So we get Newton's law for each mass. So what's Newton's law for, I'll start with M2, what's it? M2A equals to what? And so I'm, I'm going to take this direction as positive. All right, so if I do that, I'm defining downward motion for M2 as positive, yeah? That means that M2G should be positive, right? So I should put M2G. And the tension, on the other hand, is the other way, so minus, minus T. So far, so good? That's it, that's it for, for M2, you see, because, I mean, technically speaking, you could write down an equation of acceleration in the X direction for M2, but who would do that? It would be exceedingly silly, because we know that M2 is doing not, not doing what? It's not moving in the X direction, right? So we don't need that. It's just zero equals zero, who cares? Now, this right here, we've got some work to do, don't we? See, what we should do before we do anything more is we should break the tension into its what? It, yeah, it's x and y, right? It's horizontal and vertical pieces. So this piece right here would be t cosine 30. This piece right here would be t sine 30. Do you guys see that from the, the that's the angle here is 30 degrees. So, you know, watch out for that. Don't assume it always works like that. You got to think about the trigonometry. If some evil instructor gives you a different angle and a different problem, don't, you know, assume the equations are the same. You got to think through it. Think through the trigonometry. Mental note, closed door before class. <laughs> I did it last time. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Oh, by the way, guys, what's on test one? 
pretty much this stuff, right? Like, it, the test one essentially gets to applications of Newton's laws. And so like once you understand this material, and we still have a little bit more to go with like, um, you know, terminal velocity, whatever that means. Like I haven't talked about that yet. But that, that's pretty much the theoretical core of test one. So once you finish mission three, you should be well on your way to success on test one if you've processed the missions, yeah? So, all right, so, uh, okay, so then what? Then we write what? So M2, M1 rather, M1 AX and M1 AY, let's say. What is AY? So I'm, I'm assuming, <laughs> I'm assuming that the box is not lifting off the plane, okay? So I probably should include that in the wording or something. So if AY is zero, this, sh this would be zero, right? And given that, that means that the acceleration is all in the X direction. So I can say M1A. It's the same A that we're talking about because the string doesn't stretch, right? Their motions are coupled by that string. Now what? What are the X forces? What are the Y forces? What are my choices of sign here? Let me do it. So in the X, we've got T cosine 30. And then what? The other guy, force of friction, right? So minus UK times the normal force, whatever that is, right? Is the normal, normal force equal to mg? Not here, definitely not. Um, but we can figure it out. What it, so this one gives us what? M1a is a, what? Here you got, so if we take up as positive, we got n. Um, oh yeah, plus t sine 30, which we could um, be civilized and write as t over 2. Um, minus M1G, I suppose, yeah? Now what? How many equations do you got? One, two, three. What don't we know? We don't know tension. We don't know the normal force, and we don't know the acceleration. Three equations, three unknowns. It sounds like pretty good odds to me, right? So we just got to solve these equations. How should we do that? Substitution, I think that's a good path. I would take the third equation and solve for the normal force. The third equation, this gives me that the normal force is like M1G um, minus 0.5T, right? And then I can take that and I can plug it into the second equation, right? Um, I get M1A equals to, um, I mean, let me replace that with 0 0.866 cos uh, T minus mu K times this mess here, M1G minus 0 0.5 T. So what I did was I plugged, let me give these names, let me call this equation one equation two, equation three. So this, I'm substituting equation three into equation two, right? Now the question is what you're after, right? Do you want to know the acceleration? Do you want to know the tension? Usually we're interested in acceleration, right? So um, to find acceleration, I need to eliminate the tension. So what I should do is I should take equation one and solve for T. Counterintuitive, but if you want to get rid of something, you solve for it. So T is equal to M2 um, but, but, uh, G minus M2A, right? Agree? Disagree? And so I can plug that in to this guy, and that will give me M1A equals to 0 0.86. Well, you know what? I should probably just combine things here before I, let me, let me, one more step before I do that. 
let's, let's clean things up in this equation. Let's collect all the t's together, yeah? So if I, and I'll do it up here. So if I put all the t's together, I've got, um, what do I got? I got m1 a um, plus, all right, plus mu k m1 g equal to 0 0.866, all right, but, 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 plus 0 0.5 mu k all times t. All right, so that's just rearranging the last equation I wrote. And I've done that because now I can plug t in there, right? So I've got m1a plus mu k m1g equals 0 0.866 plus 0 0.5 mu k times t. What was my, my t was m2g minus m2, I could have factored that m2 out, couldn't I? Oh well. Well, look at that. Now I've got one equation and one unknown. My one unknown is A. So solve for it. Solve for A and you got it. So I've got, you know, um, let's put all this stuff with A on one side. I've got M1, um, so M1 there, and then plus 0 0.866 M2. Uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. Anything else? Oh yeah, plus um, 0 0.5 mu k M2, all times A, I believe. I think that's everything with A I've put on the left-hand side, and that's equal to um, well, 0 0.866 plus 0 0.5 mu k times m2g minus mu k m1g. And uh, yeah, so acceleration apparently is, um, well, 0 0.866 plus 0 0.5 mu k um, all times m2 um, minus mu k times m1 all divided by m1 plus parentheses 0 0.866 plus 0 0.5 mu k times m2 all of that times g. And of course, I could go back to, you know, we, we could replace this. If you want to make it less uh, uh, hideous, this is actually what cosine theta, this is, this was a sine theta, that's where that came from, yeah? So that would be the acceleration. Now, um, does it make sense? What could we think about, like, you know, limiting case? What if, what if the, what if this angle wasn't 30 degrees? What if it was, like, close to zero degrees? What would happen then? If you think about it, if it's close to zero degrees, then the whole weight of M2 should just be pulling the box sideways, right? And like if you look at the formula, if I put zero degrees, then this is gone. And um, so you just get like M2, M2G minus mu K M1G divided by, um, well, M1 plus M2. So, well, anyway, let me not, I, don't, I think limiting case analysis for this problem is not especially profitable, but there it is. Yep. If they're not accelerating at the same rate, 
that means the string is stretching. If you think about it, like if I had part of the string was at one meter per second and another was at two meters per second, then if you examine the like sub parts of the string that comprise the string, you see that they have to be separating. For the string not to stretch, they have to share the same acceleration. Not the same direction, mind you, like the direction changes, that's the magic of the pulley, right? It turns things around, but the magnitude of the tension has to be the same. Yeah. So for M1, we said that normal force and T73 are positive, but for M2, M2, T is negative, but when I'm positive, why is it in different directions? Is it better? Or why does it change? It, it changes because the question is if the, if the string connects the two things, right? Once I define downward as positive, right, I have to ask the question, if down is positive, what motion corresponds to a downward motion in the box, right? Well, if I pull the string down, I'm pushing the box to the right. That makes right positive. If I'm going to, unless I want to define a different acceleration for the box and for the other, I don't want to do that. I want to use the same acceleration because it's shared because, like I was just saying, the string doesn't stretch. Okay, this problem's kind of hard. Let's look at an easier problem, yeah? What if instead of an inclined plane, what if we just have a pulley, right, attached to the roof like that, yeah? And we've got, you know, M1 on one side and M2 on the other side. What happens? Again, assuming that the pulley is essentially massless, right, and um, that the string doesn't stretch, what's the resulting acceleration? What do you guys think? It depends on how heavy they are. It depends on, yeah, it depends on which mass is bigger, right? So what, what do you guys want to do? Which, which mass do you want to be bigger? Mass one? Okay. So mass one is greater than mass two. We're going to assume that, okay? If that's the case, what happens? It does what? Mass 1 goes down, mass 2 goes up, right? So what's the acceleration though, you know? H how fast does that happen? I think that depends on what? Yeah, right, it depends on the, ra you say the ratio of mass 1 and mass 2? Maybe. We'll find out, right? How can we calculate it? Well, you know, this wouldn't make a very good like English class or something because I'm basically telling you that every single story that we write in here, it's exactly the same. Every single one, it's the same stupid story because it's always you write down the free body diagrams and you go from there, right? Same literary device every time. So like here, we, we have the free body diagram on M1 and the free body diagram on M2. And, um, and we can talk about the tension, right? So we got the tension pulling up here, and the tension's also pulling up here. So tension, tension. And um, what else is going on? Well, you've got force of gravity, right? M1g goes down. And over here, M2g goes down, right? But then anything else? Well, that's it. This is much, I should have started with this one, right? Sorry, I'll do that. <clears throat> um, it's the bad influence of looking at my missions, you know? Um, okay, so um, Newton's equations then. M2a. And we're going to take the red arrow to define the sense of positive acceleration, okay? So if that's positive acceleration, that means that for M2, upward is positive, right? So for M2, we've got T minus what? Minus M2g. And there you go. That's Newton's equation. How about... Newton's equation for M1, what's it look like? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So what should I write here? 
they're not the same, right? There's an asymmetry. One's going up, one's going down. And since we're using A, the, the same acceleration to describe both, like we, we need to address that. So um, downward is positive for M1. So I write M1G, right, minus T. I should have started with this example. We would have felt so much better about our day if we'd done this one first, you know? Why did I do that one first? Look at that algebra, hideous algebra. You know what the word algebra means? It's, what's that? Stinky? No, it, it's, it's an Arabic word that comes from bone setting. It's like, you know, to re reset the bones, you have to like rearrange them. It's like that. It's, it's actually really, really painful, the word, its origin. But anyway. So at least that's what it says on Wikipedia, so it must be true. OK, so um, if you add these equations, life is grand, right? So you got M1A plus M2A is equal to, hey, the tension cancels. Woohoo! So you've got um, M1G minus M2G. And lo and behold, we get the acceleration is M1 minus M2 divided by M1 plus M2 times G. Do you guys know the name of this example? It has a name. This, this doesn't have a name. What's that? Napoleon? Oh, no, you, you didn't say, you, you said a pulley? Yeah. Yeah. No, no. I mean, if you don't know it, you don't know it, it's fine. But this is, this is called an Atwood machine. I think understanding this is sort of at the base. It's like the entry level example to starting to understand block and tackle which all of you guys, of course, are like really well versed in since you're, you know, you spent your teen years as marins, you know, like, uh, like sailors, right? Hoisting the mainsail and all that junk. But um, maybe not. Does this, form, does this formula make sense? What happens if M1 is equal to M2? We get zero. Does that mean that they're motionless? It means the acceleration is zero. It may or may not mean they're motionless, right? What that means is if they have equal mass, if you move it a little bit, it'll keep going at constant velocity. This is a lab you do. You actually set it up, and you can see that if you match the weights exactly, and you give it just a little tip, a little, little, little tip it'll just kind of keep slowly gliding, right? On the other hand, if the masses are not matched, there'll be an acceleration. It's not the ratio, though, right? It's something more complicated. It's the difference of the masses divided by the sum. And while I have assumed that mass 1 is greater than mass 2 to aid the, to facilitate the discussion in here, the equations that we set up really aren't based on that. What this means is that under the assumption that M1 is greater than M2, it makes A positive. What happens if M2 is greater than M1, M1 though? This equation still makes sense. It just goes the other way, and acceleration is negative. Because we can define positive direction to be whatever we want. Right? So, you know, <laughs> there is a certain amount of freedom here in choosing variables. Let's see here. Anything else we can glean from this? Um, what happens, what happens if, if, um, if M2 is much, much less than M1? If M2 is much, much less than M1, what, is this, what does this become? What would M1 minus M2 over M1 plus M2 be as, uh, essentially equal to? M2 is like nothing, right? So it's just M1 over M1, which is 1, right? And I just heard it. It's G, right? If the one mass is much, much smaller than the other, 
the larger mass is just just free falling. And of course the other one is just flying upwards at the same rate. So you can experience this if you like hold on to a rope and then you know your cartoon villain drops the piano on the other side of the rope then you will free fall upward while the piano free falls downward on the other side of the pulley, right? Assuming that you don't weigh as much as a piano. But hey, these days there's electric pianos, so all bets are off, you know? They're not bad. I love my electric piano. Moving the electric piano is a joy. I have moved three times, four times, I forget. A number of times in the past few years. Every time we move, we have a piano that moves with us. A horrible, horrible piano. <laughs> Pianos are expensive to move. Did you know that? When you, buy, when you buy your first piano, ask yourself the question, am I going to move? If the answer to that question is yes, I'm going to move, wait. Electric pianos are 90% as good. They're easy to move. Go that way. That's the, what you want to do. You, I mean, how many, probably no music majors here anyway, so I'm wasting my time, but... Some of you may like marry a music major, who knows, right? Could happen. Anyway, that's the Atwood machine. We have time for one more example. Oh man, I had, I had this grand three-dimensional example planned for today. And wouldn't you know it, ran out of time. Okay, so the example we do have time for though, because math is easy is this. If your net force is, let's say, alpha times t, comma, beta times t squared, right? Find the motion. How do you do it? So you, I'll give you the net force. How do you find the, fo the motion? What we have is the mass times the acceleration is equal to alpha t, beta t squared. So what that tells me is that dv dt is equal to, well, alpha over m times t, comma, beta over m times t squared. Integrate. I get the velocity at time t is equal to the initial velocity plus vector um, alpha over 2m t squared comma beta over 3m t cubed. You can check it out. Calling that v naught is reasonable. Plug in time zero, what do you get back? v sub zero, right? So that's a good label for this constant vector. This constant vector is the initial velocity of the system. Integrate again, right? Because this is equal to dr dt. And if we integrate again, we get that the motion, the equation of motion is this, r0 plus t times v0, because the integral of a constant is time times the constant, still true for a vector, and um, plus, well, alpha over 6m t cubed, comma, beta over 12m t to the fourth. And there you go. We found the equation of motion. Don't be afraid of this problem. This problem is a gift on the test. It's much, much easier than something with a plane and a pulley. Yeah? So if I give you a free gift like this on the test, please accept it. And then ask me for another, you know, or something like that. Anyway, thanks guys. Hey, I got an I air horn. Oh, no. <laughs>